I'm Josh here bringing the JHS show, I guess, to Reverb in Chicago. It's good to be here and I'm here to help you because you're a pedal consumer and you need to know, does some of this stuff that pedal builders like myself say even matter? What is this stuff? We've heard stuff for 20, 30 years, all these buzzwords, all these phrases. So I'm here to help you answer a question that's burning in your heart. And that question is, what's the deal with all this pedal builder bull crap. So to get into this, we have interviewed 1 million disgruntled pedal customers from all over the earth. There are even a couple in space uh, with the NASA programs and stuff. And uh, I put them inside of a original 1979 rat big box fringe logo box. I'm gonna open the box, pull out a question. We'll see where this goes. First question is, What's the deal with germanium versus silicon? Is one better than the other? The short answer is no. One is not better than the other. There is no better. So germanium transistors were the first transistors made to replace valves or tubes. So this happens, you know, in the 60s, let's say that. And then in the 70s, we have a better version of the transistor called the silicon. And better in that term means more stable, more reliable, easier to design with, easier to manufacture, easier to predict what they're gonna do. So germanium has a sound and silicon has a sound, but you can make a good silicon fuzz face, for instance. I think the Bonamassa is germanium, but it doesn't matter. There are really good silicon fuzz faces in the same series. And it's not so much about the part. A lot of times, pedal makers like to talk about fancy parts, but really a fancy part's no good if the circuit isn't designed around that part. So if you take a germanium fuzz face and shove in silicon transistors, it's gonna sound like hot trash because you need to bias the circuit to the transistors. And in the same sense, you can take a silicon fuzz face and replace the transistors with germanium, which are better, It'll sound like hot trash. It's about the circuit, not the part. Next up, what's the deal with toggle switches on my overdrive pedals? What do they actually do? On overdrive pedals, it's really common to see toggle switches, like this one on my Morning Glory, or this one on Paul Cochran's Timmy. So a toggle switch is essentially the same thing that a foot switch is. Now a foot switch works like this. Your guitar goes in through the switch out this way and that's bypassed. When you turn it on, it goes in, hits the switch, but the switch detours the signal from just going out the output jack by throwing it through the circuit. And that's why you have on and off. Technically, a guitar pedal's never off. The foot switch just changes the direction like a fork in the road. So when you see toggle switches, on overdrive pedals, it's essentially doing that within the circuit that was turned on. In this case, the toggle switch of the Timmy changes the clipping diodes, meaning it's gonna have a different waveform cut, a different kind of symmetry possibly to the overdrive distortion sound. This is one form of diode. It's gonna change that fork in the road to a different style. And then sometimes you see tone altering toggle switches on drive pedals. So this on mine, uh, when it's down, it removes a capacitor. So technically down is off to a mod that I've done to the blues breaker circuit. When you flip it up, it introduces a capacitor and it pulls the high end. It kind of sucks that out and makes this pedal a little more tolerable to telecasters and bright amps when you have the drive toggle up. So a toggle switch is just a fork in the road choosing between a couple different options. What's the deal when a pedal builder says a pedal is a digital analog hybrid? What does that mean? Is it analog or is it digital? There is no dirtier word in guitar than digital. It's been a problem since the very first digital signal processing that started in the late 70s through the 80s. People just think bad when they hear digital. They think RP100R or whatever this is. You hit it, it sounds like a swarm of bees. I'm not saying you can't get a good sound out of this. I guarantee I can. But the connotation is digital's bad. 
Analog is good. Why would you ever combine them? I can't handle this. So the answer is, when you hear digital analog hybrid, that means there's a circuit that's analog and some digital things are helping that or controlling that. That's usually the case. Now we see this with Strymon, we see this with my good friend Joel at Chase Bliss. He's a master of it and he actually has a trademark saying, I believe, which is digital brain, analog heart. And I think Joel's saying explains it very, very well. His pedals are an analog signal path pedal, meaning your guitar is going through real analog parts. This is a fuzz, it's using real transistors. His delay has a real bucket brigade analog part, but it has a digital brain. The digital brain is controlling all the cool things in the circuit. And I did this with the Packrat Bonsai Muffaletta where you have an all analog rat circuit in the Packrat. But when you turn this, there's a little computer brain in here changing the railways real quick. I like that I honestly don't know. I don't know what's next. It's like living on the edge. What's the deal with true bypass? And is it as big a deal as some people act like it is? Do buffers really suck my tone? All right. The answer to this is no. It's not that big a deal. And do buffers always suck your tone? No, there are no absolutes in this. It depends on the guitar rig. Some context really helps. So the first pedals ever made, they kind of started with a bypass system, meaning an on and off system that didn't necessarily always completely turn the pedal off. And I would call this bad bypass. So it's like, it doesn't really turn it off. It doesn't really bypass the clean signal around the circuit. Instead, it kind of let the circuit suck some of the tone away. And in that sense, old original Waz, old fuss fizzes, they do suck tone. Boss comes along, kind of the hero of this moment in the late 70s, and they bring to the market buffered bypass. They get rid of the clunky on and off switch that you saw, and they add this nice, beautiful, soft touch. And when you hit the button, a group of transistors actually actively buffer your signal and change the direction or the fork in the road with circuitry. And so even when the pedal's off, your signal's going through the boss buffer. Now this is good because the boss buffer, it helped defeat a problem that pedals had had for years and years, which is capacitance in cables. Every foot of a guitar cable rolls off the high end a little. And the boss buffer, if you're just using one or two, it actually helps your signal dramatically versus the pedals made before that in the 70s. So then the 90s come along and we have this big boutique movement. All of these pedal builders kind of going back to the roots and fighting the big box companies of the 80s and all of their pedals were primarily true bypass because it's easier to do, less circuitry, cheaper to build, and so of course they're gonna say true bypass is better. You see, true bypass means that when you hit the switch, it completely bypasses your signal all the way around the circuit, no buffer or anything. And the problem there is, you have huge capacitance issues if you're running long guitar cable lines and if your pedal board's big at all. If you have all true bypass, your bypass signal will suck. It's almost as if your strings are old, but if you reintroduce a good buffer, you'll be amazed at what actually happens. So neither's better, it's just about the application in your rig. What's the deal when a pedal builder says their pedal is a big muff style pedal? a fuzz face style or a fuzz face variant, or this is a tube screamer style pedal. Why not just buy a tube screamer? So the answer here is pretty simple. It means that they've taken that classic circuit or in engineering terms, we would call it a topology. They've taken the big muff circuit. They've used that as their foundation and they've tweaked it to their liking. They've modded the pedal. That's what it means in short. Pedal building is a lot like cooking. You can have a cheeseburger at 20 different places, but it's still a cheeseburger. So when you pick up a swollen pickle by way huge, it's still a big muff, but you know what? 
George Trips did what he liked to it. It's really cool. And it's not really a big muff anymore, but it is. It's like the cheeseburger thing. Next question. What's the deal with pedals that have nine volt or 18 volt options? Which is it? Nine or 18, what do I do? If you've ever asked this question, it's because you suddenly see some pedal builder say, you can run this pedal at 18 volts. And you're thinking, I thought pedals were nine volts, right? Or you just see someone on a forum go, oh my gosh, I plugged 18 volts into this pedal and it finally came to life and now I love it and I used to hate it. So what is this all about? Well, most pedals do run at nine volts and I highly encourage you to not just plug in 18 volts to any pedal. For instance, if you take something like a Klon or a KTR and plug 18 in, it's gonna absolutely destroy it and you'll never get it fixed. So there are applications where pedal builders say, you know, try 18. So this Pigtronics Octava, you can use 18. On the Ibanez Tube Screamer, you can use 18 and it'll give you more headroom. Now, think of it like, but not really like an amp's wattage. If you plug into a 10 watt amp, it's not gonna have a lot of headroom. You're gonna play and you're gonna clip it a little earlier. If you plug into a 50 watt, you're gonna have more clean headroom. In my opinion, it's negligible on most every circuit, but some people swear they hear a difference. Some people love it and it's up to you. So try it, read the owner's manuals, ask your manufacturer of the pedal you love. Don't blow your stuff up because that's not cool. Next up, how many of these are there? There's a million. What's the deal with handmade pedals? That means it's not one of those printed circuit boards, right? Because PCBs are bad, right? Okay. A handmade pedal comes from the boutique movement of the 90s which ironically and historically is actually the second boutique movement. The first boutiqueers were the very first pedals ever made. When you buy an original tone bender, fuzz face or whatever, people were sitting around hand building pedals. People seem to have forgotten this. Then in the eighties, we have the Boss pedals and the Ibanez pedals and it becomes a factory thing. You have an assembly line and you have some machines involved, but they're still kind of handmade. And now you have these arguments on forums and online that unless a pedal's handmade, it's trash. And that's just not true. In most cases, some pedal brands got better when they included machinery. Better soldering, better application of the circuit board. And yeah, it's just a myth. It's one of those things that's really frustrating. It gets confusing. Now, is it cool to hand populate a circuit board, solder it by hand? Absolutely. It doesn't make it sound better though. And if you like that, if you like the feeling of owning a hand-built pedal where a person made it one at a time, put that attention to detail in, go buy it. That's a perfectly great reason, but don't do it because you think it's gonna sound better. It's just not. As far as PCBs are concerned, some of you don't know what that means. It means printed circuit board. And I just so happen to have an original untainted 1991 Proco Rat reissue circuit board that no one ever used. I have a package of these actually. I don't wanna brag, but it's a kind of a cool thing to have. But that's a printed circuit board, see? The parts are here. There's traces that connect all the parts. You populate it by hand, you solder it. That's a PCB. So in this case, this now vintage reissue rat it was handmade on a PCB. Handmade doesn't mean not PCB. Just buy the pedal if it sounds good. I've been here all day, 12 hour shift, not paying me a dime. All right, what's the deal with the old man down at the bar saying, tones in the fingers, son? Do you know any pedals that have fingers in them? Next. What's the deal with op amps? Do some actually sound different or are they basically the same? So the biggest pedal at heart here with this discussion is the Tube Screamer. For the love of Moses and all of his children, I can't tell you how many times people get on a forum and they lose their mind over if 
the tube screamer has the right chip. Also, rats. It's insane. You gotta have the LM308 or it's not gonna sound like a rat. If you don't have the 4558P made in blah, 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 this year, this month, and this date, that ain't no tube screamer I'm gonna play. It's not about the part, it's about the circuit. And this fable myth chip stuff is just really frustrating because the chip isn't the circuit. It's just an amplifier. The circuit's the circuit. The chip is a part in a circuit that can easily be replaced. So, again, if you like vintage, if you like the nostalgia, if you like knowing you have an old unit, that's awesome. Play old pedals, play old gear, but don't say the old chip sounds better. All right, what's the deal with NOS components being better than new ones? Will the right vintage transistor make me sound like Hendrix? So NOS means new old stock. And this is a thing, and I like it, I'm a big fan. I have tons of old transistors and parts that are from the 60s, from the 50s, from the 70s. And I love it because it connects me back to those moments. The parts are fun, they're fun to design with. The deal is we really like nostalgia for the most part. But NOS parts, they're really old. They aren't better. Parts have only gotten better technically since then. And when you deal with things like fuzz faces, for instance, we're talking about Hendrix. What's humorous is Hendrix preferred silicon over germanium. But people never talk about that. And apparently silicon's bad, but yet that's what he used. And then you get into these discussions about this germanium transistor sounds better than this one. And this one sounds better than this one. It's really just about what you do with the part. I feel like I've said this five times. It's not about the part. It's about the circuit that you put the parts into. If you like the old parts, buy the pedals with the old parts. If it makes you feel great, there's a thing there. Just admit it and move on. But don't say that it's better. There's no magic. Like the delay, the bucket brigade chip versus the new bucket brigade. Is there a fidelity? Yeah. There isn't. No. It's just a part. We've gone to the moon. <laughs> I door dashed food to my hotel on a phone. But you're telling me we can't make the 1940s tech? I'd like, this is a freaking supercomputer. But I can't, we can't make a chip for an overdrive? Do you know how stupid that sounds? One more thing on that to be fair, because it is really real. Why do the different parts? So an amazing pedal that I love is the Analog Man Sunface. And he makes this with NTK red dots and he has this other transistor and RCA transistors. There are some sonic differences there. And it's fun to look at fuzz faces and try them with the different transistors. But one's not better than the other. You could equally take a Sunface and a brand new part from a brand new electronic supplier made in 2021, insert it in there, adjust that circuit and make it sound fantastic. One's not better, they're just different and that's okay. Yes. Still here. What's the deal with transistors and diodes? I see people saying these words all the time. They say things like, these are germanium, they're better. There are two different parts in the pedal world that have the tagline on them, germanium. Now, germanium means they're the very old parts. They were before silicon. So this dates these parts roughly in the 60s for sure. Now, you see germanium transistors, as we've talked about, in fuzz faces. It's just a type of transistor literally using the element germanium in it. Then you have diodes. Diodes are not transistors. A transistor is an amplifier, literally. You put your signal in, you give it some voltage, and it outputs a louder voltage than you put in. So a transistor is just an amplifier. It can boost. You can boost so much that it fuzzes. You can do whatever you want with it, but at the end of the day, it's an amplifier. A diode is not an amplifier. A diode is a completely passive part in most pedals, and it's just used to pull the signal down and clip the waveform. So don't confuse germanium diodes with germanium transistors. 
and don't worry too much about either one. That'd be my advice. If it sounds good, again, it is good. We're down to the bottom of the barrel here, such is life. What's the deal with asymmetrical clipping versus standard clipping? Kind of sounds like BS. Is it true though? So clipping in this type of discussion is referenced back to the diode I just talked about. So clipping first happened in the world of overdrive distortion pedals really in the 70s. There were a couple things in the 60s that used diode clipping, but in the 70s it got really fun with the Distortion Plus, the DoD 250, the RAT, the DS1, and most famously, the Tube Screamer. So the Tube Screamer clips symmetrically. When you have a waveform, you have a top and a bottom, and it clips those evenly. That's because it has two diodes clipping, one for each side of the waveform. If you pull one of them out, or if you add two and one up here, you're gonna clip one part of the waveform differently than the other, which is asymmetrical. So symmetrical is a good even cut across the waveform on both sides. Asymmetrical means one side of that waveform is getting clipped harder than the other. And some people use buzzwords like amp like or tube sound, whatever. It's just different ways of using the diode to clip the waveform. Again, please play guitar. I'm, I'm begging you. This is the last question. They've ensured me I can go home and be with my family again if I answer this. What's the deal with this pedal cleans up nicely when you roll back the volume? Doesn't every pedal clean up when you hit it with a softer signal? How nicely does it need to clean up before someone can say it cleans up nicely? The cleanup thing has its origins, in my head at least, with seeing Eric Johnson on Austin City Limits in his marching band jacket with the Strat, and he's not touching any pedals, yet he goes from glistening clean, like the best clean tone on earth, and suddenly like a wall of fuzz. And then I watched it over and over. And you know what he does? He just rolls the volume on his strap. So that's what they're talking about. A pedal like a fuzz face that you can max the fuzz control out. In my opinion, you should max the fuzz face out and gaff tape it. Every other setting is useless. And use your guitar volume and it cleans up. Actually, it's such a good clean sound, it's almost better than your clean sound. So what's the deal with that? It's because certain circuits love the interaction of your guitar's pickups. It's an impedance thing. It's how it feels the guitar. It's kind of like a breath back and forth in between the two circuits. And when you roll it off, it just perfectly cleans up the fuzz face. Other good pedals that do this are the blues driver, I mean, there's so many. Some Tube Screamer style variants do it. My pedal that does it best is the Crayon. It's pretty shockingly good. I didn't intend it to. I actually put this out and then like a year later, someone here at CME, I think, said, gosh, have you seen that it does this? And I didn't know it did. Some pedals don't clean up well. If you take a Morning Glory or, I don't know, if you take this, it's not gonna clean up at all. This is how the circuits are made, but that's what people mean. Um, so try it with all your drive pedals, see what you think. Just experiment, just try stuff. But most of all, please play guitar. I can now leave. My family's been wanting to see me for a long time. I'm gonna go home. I haven't seen my children. I think I have another child. I'm leaving now. They said in the contract I could leave.